Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, BAFTA. Uh, hello, guests, friends. Um, many thanks for being afforded the chance to speak on a subject so mercurial, so elusive, we can only pretend to know what we are talking about when we are talking about it. The dark art, the lonely art, the bloody difficult art, the under-celebrated art that dare not speak its name, but we will speak it, the screenplay. Um, in the late 90s, I lived for a couple of years in Los Angeles where how-to screenwriting books were in every bookstore en route to being in every apartment. Everyone, it seemed, wanted the Midas touch to write Martin Scorsese's next picture and to eventually be able to deliver masterclasses on the lucrative masterclass circuit. These books were everywhere, and I remember one title in particular. It was really popular, The 90-Day Screenplay. It was a bestseller when it came out, an absolute Bible for many, and it gave every taxi driver and secretary and busboy the sense that the big time was close at hand. How close? Well, just 90 days and $15 away. <laughs> but this book's days at the top of the nonfiction bestseller lists were numbered, for a new Bible was soon to appear and the 90-day screenplay was duly knocked off its perch by a sensational new bestseller, How to Write a Movie in 21 Days. <laughs> Clearly, the latter was a superior book by some margin. I mean, same result, 61 days less time. <laughs> and a publishing pattern had thereby been established. Soon, we had Darren Donnelly and his brother Travis stepping up to the plate. Dan and Trav's book was called The 10-Day Screenplay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Apparently, Dar and Trav had found a way to write and incite to be written nine feature films of similar or better quality than their predecessors in the exact same time frame that the 90-Day Screenplay could only produce one. <laughs> Things were heating up. And begging the question, would records continue to be broken? <laughs> As the history of the 100 meter dash has shown, we, ha we have not yet reached the maximum speed at which screenplays can be written. But there is, of course, a logical terminal velocity, the fastest speed at which you can humanly type 120 pages. <laughs> the ultimate title, therefore, we may yet see the 80 words a minute screenplay. <laughs> Speed aside, all these books have something in common. They tell the same story. They have identified key, key qualities that many commercially successful screenplays share. They have codified a language that has been adopted by creative executives in both film and television. In my experience, these books won't hurt you. They're not harmful to writers at any rate. They are only harmful to producers and to funders, financiers. Why? Because books like this provide producers and funders a template and a vocabulary by which to measure and critique screenplays to allow them to say where and how they don't conform to certain moot rules whose purpose is to minimize the risk to their financial investment. The executives are entitled to this position and are expressly employed to decline uninsurable ideas. Those two risky proposals that have no successful precursors, their position is entirely sane. But this has resulted in a landscape where, as the screenwriter, you will always, always be asked to define your story in terms of the classic three-act structure because it's then that those who fly business class will feel that they have their best shot at evaluating its potential. Footnote number one, they will never ask you to present your idea as a five-act structure because no one actually knows what that is. <laughs> so to survive in the business, 
it's necessary to understand the, the pressure that producers and financiers operate under. As such, you have to know what a three-act structure is. Fortunately, it's pretty simple. Reason, perhaps, for its broad appeal. And here it is. Act one, the shit hits the fan. <laughs> part two, oh, sorry, act two, part A, the hero has no choice but to act. Midpoint, realization of initial goal, but first appearance of a greater goal. Act two, part B, even more shit hits multiple fans, <laughs> ending in a river of excrement in which the hero is more or less submerged, otherwise known as the lowest point. <laughs> Act three, with the clock now ticking and the hero digging deep, the river is drained, most of the fans but not all cleaned, the hero reaching a higher state of maturity and reconciliation. So there we have it. A mold, a, su a famously successful mold into which you can now pour your slurry of words. When it sets, you will have a screenplay. It will at least look like a screenplay, read like a screenplay, conform to the expectations of a screenplay, and may possibly be saleable as a screenplay. But is it any good? Does it have anything fresh and new to say? And does it employ exciting new ways to say it? Well, those are other questions entirely and the only ones we should spend any time discussing. One of the nice things about preparing to give a talk like this is that it's forced me to think about how I do what I do, something I've never before felt inclined to do. I honestly don't know where I am in my own personal climb, but till now I've never looked down, never taken stock, and perhaps thought it, in, it, thought it inadvisable to do so. So when I began to consider what I might talk about today, I first asked myself, well, where am I now? I mean, right now. The answer, without false modesty, is that wherever I am, it feels like a good place, and by most systems of measure, it's better than ever, a place where I at least feel like I am able to take on more and achieve more than I ever have before. Fewer things intimidate me, and the rejections, which never stop, by the way, are fewer and less impactful, while the times when I'm told I've knocked it out of the park have increased. So maybe, maybe I've gotten good at what I do. And if I can afford to let myself think that, then it begs a big question. OK then, bright guy, what changed? How did you get good? And is the answer useful to anyone else? Well, we're about to find out. The facts are that I'm currently working on five major feature film projects concurrently with some of the biggest film companies and some of the best directors in the world. And I'm finding that I can handle it. I'm required to jump between these projects uh, at any given hour, on any given day, and I find I can handle it. And the pressure of expectation at this point is considerable, but I'm handling it. 20 years ago, for certain, I would not have been able to handle it, for sure, no chance. So what changed? What makes the me of now any more capable than the me of yesteryear? Is there any difference? Why am I now able to handle what hitherto would have overwhelmed me? My attempt to answer this question is your fault, BAFTA. You started this, so don't blame me. So let's go. Now, there is such mystery surrounding the craft of screenwriting, with so many different theories out there about how it's done, that our industry has felt it necessary to nail down a few basic rules, golden rules. I want to quickly mention some of the big ones, but let me add another big caveat. If these rules were any good, then simply by following them, you'd perforce end up with a superb end product. But the fact is this, these rules only work 
sometimes. I've had now some 25 years trying to make films, and almost everything I will say today can be just as convincingly contradicted. When I make a definitive statement, bear in mind the opposite can also be true. For instance, strong arguments could be made for the following heresies. One, write what you don't know so that your personal journey is an exploration. In other words, write what you want to know. Did Shakespeare visit Venice? Did Jules Verne go to the moon and back? Two, tell it, don't show it. Sometimes it's better to hear about it than to see it. What comes out of a human mouth can have more emotional value than any toppling skyscraper. When the lovers kiss at last, perhaps it's better to fade to black. Number three, never let your characters tell you where the story should go. You're paid to be in charge. Your characters are your slaves, no more. Order them around brutally. They may not be animals, but to paraphrase Hitchcock, they should be treated like animals. <laughs> <laughs> Four, structure is nothing. Structure is nothing. It is, as T.S. Eliot once put it, just the meat you throw the guard dog so you can get inside and rip the joint off. 2001 A Space Odyssey is one of the greatest films ever made, partly because its structure is indiscernible. It is a vacation from narrative. So now we have heard from the rebels, the contrarians. We can move on and discuss iron cast principles that I have found useful sometimes, but not always. Powerful truths that have worked on some occasions and not others. Golden rules that have only once or twice paid dividends. For those needing certainties, I give you the exits. So how do you write a screenplay so good that millions that people will invest millions of dollars to see it made and millions of people will shell out to go and see it. Evaluating the potential of your idea. Imagine the situation. You have a concept for a film, a pitch you hope to sell. You go into, your, you go into a room and want to convince money-minded executives that your idea is going to make them A, a lot of money, or B, make them no money at all and possibly lose some, but will gain them some kudos at awards time that in turn may make them feel better about themselves when they're old. <laughs> the moment arrives, you're invited to speak, to present your idea. No matter how well you do it, and pitching is a science in, it, science in itself, which we don't have time to go into now, you are asking them to make an enormous leap of faith. It's as if you were trying to sell someone a car when all you have are a select few of the car's parts lying around on your front lawn. You are, in effect, telling them to look at a few extracts from the car you have in mind and imply there's more where that came from. To their valid question about whether your proposed motor ve vehicle will ever run, you reply, for sure, absolutely. <laughs> what will be the range and speed of the vehicle, they then ask. Your reply, oh, well, we will have to make it first, but we plan to ensure that it will be a miracle of economy and performance, quite unlike any other car previously manufactured. When then asked to offer some proof for this claim, you struggle to provide it. Maybe just saying, well, you'll have to trust me. I'm describing it in this way because I think it's useful to put yourself in the producer's funder's shoes. It is very hard to evaluate what will work and what won't work, and why these executives are desperate to fall back on some system of, of evaluation. This is why producers and funders set so much store in the power of the premise. If your film has a seductive premise, you have your best shot at winning over even the most risk-averse producer or funder. The premise is often called the elevator pitch or car park pitch. It's the reductio absurdum of your complex, deeply nuanced idea into a vulgar soundbite. My second to last film took 10 years to finance. 
even though it was about one of the most recognizable and brilliant men in the cosmos. Why? Well, because my elevator pitch went like this. Quadriplegic gets cuckolded and so writes a book merging Einsteinian relativity with quantum mechanics. <laughs> you can just see the film company boss glazing over, <laughs> adjusting his glasses on her nose, glancing at her watch with zero discretion and then asking me, what else you got? <laughs> By far the most determining factor in a script being good or, better still, great, and by far the most decisive factor in getting it made is the quality of your original concept. From this, even the dimmest financier will be able to weigh its commercial viability. It is a truism that if you have a million dollar idea, you don't have to be a very good writer to write a saleable script, get the film made, and even be successful. But if you have a mediocre, or lousy idea for a film. Your name could be William Shakespeare and you won't be able to get it off the ground unless you hang out with Megan Ellison. <laughs> when I was 25 years old, I wrote with a friend of mine a stage play in three weeks. My buddy Stephen came over, said, hey, why don't we write a play about male strippers? Maybe he'd been drinking. And I said, gee, I'm not sure, Stephen. I, know, I don't know much about male strippers. But how about we write a play about some regular guys who think it, it'll be easy to be male strippers? So we did that. It was a good idea. A good idea is a good idea. And, uh, and can prove impervious even to slapdash craftsmanship. In fact, this particular idea was so good it just sailed away, became New Zealand's most commercially successful play of all time, and continues to play around the world 25 years later. So why did it take off? It was a good and universally appealing idea. I tried many other times to find another one just like it. Hmm, not so easy. Great ideas are rare birds, you see. You need binoculars, and you need, a, you need to, keep a, to keep real quiet. And you need to know what you're looking for. So where do good ideas come from? I hear you asking. Where to find great stories with strong premises? A, in your own personal story, B, in the nation's history and culture, C, in your community, D, in other cultures, E, in other stories that have gone before, F, in your imagination entirely, G, in all the above. My advice is, the only advice is, look everywhere, inside and out, and look all the time. Part of being a professional is never being off duty. The hours are lousy, but it's seldom boring. Learn to notice. With any luck, you'll come up with one or two or three really great ideas in your lifetime. Most writers would settle for one. The rest of the time, you're trying to make the mediocre ones work. Don't beat yourself up about it. We're all in the same lousy boat. Great ideas are rare. And here's something else. A great idea isn't, even, isn't ever delivered to you whole with all the elements in the right place. At least I've never been gifted one. Great ideas are made by you. The germ of a great idea isn't a film until you've cracked the story. The internal engine of the story has to be made to work. Reality is messy, and history is a lousy filmmaker. And the writer's job is to lick it all into shape. Sometimes you can see how to do this from the off. These are the best projects. You can see right away how the idea might be turned into a story that can work, and you have to know what to look for. Here's what I look for in order of importance. One, a story in which I can foresee before I've written a single word most of the major twists and turns in that journey. Two, characters who I can't wait to gain control of, to subordinate, to make them do or say things that are so extreme and, and out of the ordinary, that they're almost unacceptable. Three, a bittersweet ending. I believe perfect bliss is the preserve of cats, small children, drunks, and idiots. Importantly for me, I need the, to sense the ending before I begin. 
for only then will I know how to tell the story in the right way. Plan your story. If this sounds unromantic, screenwriters are not tasked to be poets. You can and should keep a certain analytical distance from your work. Four, finally, a story with dimension with some cultural importance or personal significance. A story that contains issues I am burning to examine and which will take me into some extreme of human experience. The prospect of telling the story must stir you to, a, to great excitement. This excitement will be tested and will diminish as you struggle with the telling. So make sure you have a huge reserve of it, of it before you begin. Let me expand on these points. Number one, no one knows where good ideas come from. If we did, we'd go there more often. But we can agree, at least, that they are around us all the time, and the task is to notice them. Number two, as I say, a great idea isn't ever delivered to you whole. The story has to be cracked. Hollywood producers will pay a great deal of money to a writer if they can crack a story, work out how to tell it in a compelling way. The internal engine of the story has to be made to work. Sometimes you can see how to do this. They are the best projects. Three, character. In a fiction, a person's character is their fate. So know the fate where this character has to end up in your story and then select the, the character traits appropriate to that fate. In a non-fiction project, you don't quite have that flexibility, but you can still make them do and say what you need them to do and say in, honor to, in order to honor the film's theme. Number four, humor. I always look for some element of humor. To me, no story, if it is to make a claim of being true to life, can be devoid of humor. Almost every meaningful human interaction you will ever have will include some attempt at humor. It's the standard currency of conversation and how human beings do business. Humor is part of the ritual of negotiation. So if you want your stories to feel real and truthful, don't forget about humor. Number four, know your ending before you begin. For me, I never feel I have a grip on, on a story until I know the destination or have at least a sense of it. In fact, I never take a project on unless I know the ending and am convinced it's a powerful one. Now, not all writers will agree with this. Many writers write freestyle, spontaneously, making it up as they go, with no idea where their story is going. They say that this is what makes the process feel exciting and artful, almost spiritual, the next step being the only important one. But personally, I found that those writers who are most vocal about their opposition to structure and formula and planning out their story are invariably crap at structure and formula and planning out their story. <laughs> Harold Pinter never planned any of his plays. Really? Well, it shows. I love his plays, but it shows. The plays are indisputable masterpieces, but their endings are the weakest part. And in a movie, a weak ending is a deal breaker. With endings being so important in movies, because it's what the audience takes away, it's a very brave writer indeed, and a very brave producer, who will spend years on a project where the ending is the weakest part of the screenplay. I sometimes feel I need to know what my ending is first, because I just don't have the guts to go through all those months of uncertainty and doubt and self-hatred and, expect, expect, and personal loathing tied up with not knowing where the hell I'm going. And it's true. Writers who write without a plan will all tell you the same thing. Halfway through the writing process, the misery starts. Major perturbation. As the original impulse weakens, as a mess develops in the middle, as problems pop up, improbabilities, forced transitions. This way of working always gets the writer down. It's migraine inducing, anxiety spawning. Simply the freestyle writer will suffer more than the structuralist. 
and I began as a freestyler who believed his intuitions would carry him to victory. So I'm speaking from experience. I learned eventually that lack of planning will always catch up with you. God will not always provide. Let me give you an example of a perfect ending, one that could only have been achieved by a structuralist, an author knowing exactly where she was going before picking up her pen. Here it is. There was a young man from Hibernia who rhymed himself into a hernia. He became quite adept at rhyming except for the odd anticlimax. <laughs> Take a bow, Mr. Stoppard. You will excuse the irony that the ending is not an anticlimax at all, quite the contrary. Now, this is a perfect example of a perfect ending for two reasons. The final line had to be known before the first line was written. It was, of course, the reason the poem was written, and it, and it dictated these preceding lines. Secondly, while being about an anticlimax, it's anything but an anticlimax. It's the perfect climax climax because it delivers satisfaction in a way we were tricked into not being able to foresee, but which when it arrives superseded our expectations. The rhyme pattern promised us a final line that would rhyme with Hibernia. And then the author detonated our expectations and delightfully, because the author had something even better up his clever sleeve, that he has craftily set up for us. Know your ending. I personally never decide to work on a project unless I know the ending and know that it satisfies my own personal criteria for a good and worthwhile climax. OK, so let's say you had an idea for an interesting premise and you've come up with a really satisfying end point that delivers in an unexpected way on the potentials of that premise. How do you write the hundred or so pages in between? Well, you reverse engineer your story. What do I mean by reverse engineer? I mean that the ending will dictate almost everything you need to know about the story that precedes it. Character, plot, theme, and structure. Example, if your film is about a talented pig who wants to run faster than any pig has ever run before, and you have foreseen the ending, and foreseen it involving Porky winning the 100 meters at the Olympics, then the task is to instill in your audience for the preceding 100 minutes a subconscious craving to see a pig, its arms and legs pumping, <laughs> hurtling down the track to victory. That's your job. But it must be a victory the author has tricked the audience into not quite being able to anticipate. If at any point it's too evident to the audience that bovine gold is where the story is headed, then no swine on a dais will save you. If they can see it coming, they will hate you for it. We can call the sleight of hand concealment of true intentions. The film at the outset must one way or the other Ask a question that your secret ending will answer, but not in the way they had expected it to be answered. He became quite adept at rhyming, except someone? <laughs> Mr. Stoppard, if he's present, <laughs> for the odd anticlimax. On the point that your ending contains the clues you need for how to write the preceding hundred pages. Here are two examples. Imagine a climactic scene that occurs on top of the Eiffel Tower. Then it may make you decide to create a character who, in the first act, suffers from vertigo. If the character has vertigo, this may then oblige scenes to explain why the character suffers from vertigo. The writer's job is to earn the emotion they wish the audience to feel. And you earn it by setting, up, setting it up in a way that ensures the biggest payoff. The Deer Hunter, one of the greatest films, is a masterpiece of reverse engineering. 
The ending involved De Niro in Saigon playing Russian roulette with another man in order to save his life. To make us care about the outcome and to make it powerful, the writers decided to make the two men spiritual brothers, make them familiar with gunplay, and go further, make them brothers pledged to look after one another no matter what. How about even make them in love with the same woman? So that maybe if one of them dies, it simplifies their love life. But make them noble also, so we don't want either of them to die. And then the gun goes off, and one of them dies. Our heart breaks, but not because the gun went off. Not at all. If the film had started with the scene, that scene, we wouldn't have cared. We care because of, of all the scenes we have seen in the previous two hours. We think of the pledge, the woman, their families back home, their lost simple dreams. In short, know your ending. Something else I've learned along the way which rises logically from this example, if there are problems in your third act, the real problem is probably in your first or second act. It's not the ending that isn't satisfying, it's your setup. The ending is fine, it's probably why you wrote the script in the first place or should have done. But you can't believe your great ending isn't working for people. The gun went off. Why is no one crying? Answer, you didn't create the right sets of preconditions that would establish audience anticipation for your obligatory but unpredictable ending. That sentence will sound like gibberish, but it actually isn't. So I'll say it again. If there are problems in your third act, the real problem is in the first act. You just didn't create the right sets of preconditions that would establish audience anticipation for your obligatory but unpredictable ending. Your Eiffel Tower climax isn't satisfying because you are omitted to give your hero vertigo in the first act. If your climax involves a reconciliation and it isn't satisfying, it's because the earlier conflict wasn't deep enough so that it made us ache for reconciliation. Make us ache for your wonderful ending, but be unable to see what form the reconciliation will come in. My personal list of favorite screenwriters are all reverse engineers, retrofitters non pareil. Robert Bolt, Alfred Hitchcock, Billy Wilder, the Cohen brothers, Woody Allen, Paddy Chayefsky, William Goldman, and my favorite screenplays all show the fingerprints of the writer knowing their ending first and writing toward it in the most elegant and satisfying way. Lawrence of Arabia, Godfather 1 and 2, Jean de Florette, Raging Bull, Casablanca, Once Upon a Time in America, All the President's Men, Star Wars. Now you don't have to work this way, and many people don't. It's just the best ones all do. <laughs> you may plan nothing and just get lucky with your ending. It happens. One of my favorite New Zealand films, Smash Palace, was a film where the filmmakers didn't have a clue how to end it. Its director, Roger Donaldson, told me that during the writing process, he and his uh, co-writer, Peter Hansard, didn't have an ending, and they were completely stumped. Their lead actor, Bruno Lawrence, a famous drinker and smoker and bon vivant, came by to check on the progress of the screenplay and was so dismayed by the possibility that the film would die for lack of an ending, he promptly fell asleep on the couch while the director and producer continued to bang their heads against the wall deep into the night. Apparently what happened then was that eventually Bruno woke up in a moment of delirious inspiration, envisaged a car on a railway line, his character, a cuckolded husband, holding a sawn-off shotgun to the head of his wife's lover, as a speeding train hurtles towards them, their mutual destruction certain, a quite good ending in itself, pretty dark, until at the last minute the train forks away, something the husband had planned for, the tracks bifurcating just before the train reaches the car, the train not harming anyone but eliciting a confession from the terrified lover. Roll in credits, they had their ending, it delivered perfectly on the premise of the film. But the moral is this, unless you have a Bruno Lawrence lying on your couch at 3 a.m., <laughs> I would caution against this approach. Create a keen anticipation for an ending we cannot foresee. 
I want to switch now to the issue of how to make yourself a better writer, no, no matter what your story is. How do you make yourself fundamentally better at what you do? There is a simple answer, and it's this. Make yourself talented. <laughs> Talent isn't something you either have or don't have. Talent is acquired. It is won. It is the result of hard work and more hard work. Only then will you become talented. Some acquire it early, during childhood, as a natural extension of a sustained period of mental engagement. Others develop it later, become talented after the age of 50, when a perhaps dormant interest is suddenly reawakened. Practice creates mastery and repeated exercise of that mastery creates talent. It doesn't come with your mother's milk or by going to an expensive school. It's inside you, waiting to come out if you have the guts to draw it out. Over time, if you work hard enough, you can set free capacities inside you that you may currently not imagine you even have. So what is the exact process by which this can be achieved? How can anyone become talented? When I started writing in my 20s, I had developed, through my interest in language, a certain aptitude and sensitivity for language. But I was, by no one's estimation, and I mean no one's, uh, and certainly not even my own, talented. These days, not even my harshest critics would say I, I'm entirely devoid of talent. So what happened? Talent is meant to be like your hair color. You can fake being a brunette, but sooner or later, everybody's going to find out the truth. <laughs> when I assess myself, I can say without blushing that I am better now at what I do than I used to be. So how did this happen? What made the difference? What was the change agent at work? Was it simply a factor of age and becoming more worldly wise? or something even more mysterious? Well, I have a theory about this, and it's even supported now by science. So I'll share it with you because it's pretty good news for all of us. Neuroscientists have only recently been looking at the matter of aptitude, and some very recent studies have come up with some pretty spectacular findings. One study focused on 2,000 black cab drivers in London. London is not laid out like a grid. It's an impossible, huge maze. You don't need to be told. But black cab drivers, in order to get their license, are forced to know every single street by street. And these guys are not rocket scientists. Many never finish school. It takes them years to learn every street and to remember it. And what researchers found, to their amazement, is that cabbies have grown a significantly larger hippocampus than the ordinary person. The hippocampus in the brain controls spatial awareness, and it turns out that the brain mass of cabbies grew to meet the extraordinary demands being placed upon their memories every day. And we can apply this example to screenwriting or any creative activity. To become adept at screenwriting, the only way, the only way to gain mastery is not by buying Darren and Travis Donnelly's ridiculous book but by making huge and sustained demands upon the networks of your brain that govern creativity. Now, were I to write a book on the subject and stuff it into LA bookstores, it'd be laughed out of town for what might we call it? Screenwriting made hard. <laughs> or, give me 10 years and I'll make you a star. <laughs> But actually, I think this is the closest we've come to a true understanding of what it takes to get real good at all. Extremely real good at all extremely complex and difficult tasks. I'm sure we all grew up being aware of the old right brain, left brain model. Right brain people work in banks and know what a square root is. Left brain people drink Beaujolais and discuss Kierkegaard and are a little bit effete. But it turns out this is all wrong. Instead, the truth, as it often is, is much, much more interesting. We now know that creativity, the entire creative 
process from preparation to incubation to illumination to verification four stages consists of many interacting cognitive processes both conscious and unconscious as well as involving emotions all operating in vast networks that reconfigure depending on what stage of the creative process you're engaged in for instance every time you try to figure out how to work spatially such as trying to work out the structure of your screenplay you will be using the same part of your brain the dorsal attention visuo spatial network that we use when we try to fit luggage into the trunk of your car when we go on holiday or if you are trying to write a lyrical passage a climactic speech at the end of your film where the sound of each word is vital then you will make greater demands on the lang language network in the broca area when jazz musicians and rappers engage in creative improvisation while in a flow state they will call upon the imagination and executive attention networks writers however can't afford such uninhibited freedom unless you are charlie kaufman so must bring this salience network back online to critically evaluate and implement your creative ideas so it seems and this is the bad news for travis and darren if you want to become a really if you want to become really talented as a creative person then you will need to develop these large scale brain networks and we are talking about training and literally growing the brain to match the task all in, in an apprenticeship of years no 9 day shortcuts what this means is that wanna be screenwriters with an interest in being talented can be so but these screenwriters will need to write one script then another then another then another until their minds are bursting like a london cabby driven mad trying to remember every twist and turn in the journey from kensington church street to wimbledon common and by the way this information used to be well known this level of devotion and concentration was actually standard in the artistic academies of previous centuries in pockets this ethos is still understood the florence academy of art maintains the old master's standards to this day their website for their 5 year apprenticeship check it out 5 years actually has this statement as individual artists are challenged to push their technical ability beyond their perceived capacity they develop strength of character and the confidence necessary to become a professional this helps create a state of mind in which they are certain of their choices we're going to show now three or four clips um the first is from the theory of everything so uh we can pull something up that was the ending of the movie that and that was the ending i knew before i started um i knew that steven's life was devoted to many things but principally the subject he kept being fascinated by was time so the unifying principle of that entire movie was time 
And when I had the idea that the movie should, at the end, reverse time and we should see the, the contents of his, of his entire life, that, that's when I sort of set out to tell that story. So that's an example of that. OK, next clip. Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stephen Hawking. Dr. Stephen Hawking. Thank you, Jim. Mm. Very nice. It is astonishing he's the first person to receive his doctorate, bearing in mind how little work he's been doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, work was the worst four letter word for Stephen. This is at Oxford, especially. He averaged an hour, an hour a day, he averaged. And now here he is, the esteemed man. <laughs> <laughs> There's astonishing levels of sloth. I've got, on the theme of sloth, Brian, how many of your lectures have I covered in the last six months when you've been doing no. research trips up no, to the Lake District? So have I. Completely how many? Oh, nice. <laughs> 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 Everything all right? I am all good. Harry will be spread out for the Welsh What can you do? Would you like a top up? Oh, please. <laughs> final image there is of the able-bodied small child and being kind of the, the adult and, the, and Stephen sort of uh, reduced to being an infant who can't get up the stairs. Sometimes when you're dealing with um, true stories, you, you, history and the facts just give you these gems. Jane's book was a very, very difficult book to adapt. It didn't have an obvious structure, but it was full of these moments which were so tremendously heartbreaking. And, and that was one of them. I added the child um, at the top of the stairs. Um, that's kind of what you, you do. You take reality and then you, you, can, you, you augment it to, to reach a sort of deeper truth to make it live in, in your consciousness even more. OK, um, next clip. I have asked Elaine to travel with me to America. She will look after me. Will she? Yes. You always used to tell me when an invitation came in. Another award. What can you do? I am sorry.
of many years. They said two. We've had so many. Everything will be okay. I have loved you. tears on, on set watching that particular one. Um, part of, again, part of the reason for wanting to tell the story is um, a very universal moment, a, a breakup between a husband and wife. Completely, it's been covered a million times in movies, but never I felt it, having to mediate through a computer. What would that be like, I asked myself, before I started writing the project? How, how can you, how, how would the simplest things be done if you had to speak through a computer, laboriously write out the words. Um, there's, I think there's 75 words in that scene. Um, and it starts with a moment of marital triumph where Stephen has conceded that there might be a God, which is very important to the very religious Jane. Um, and by 75 year, words later, they're divorced, um, which I'm quite proud of <laughs> for someone who's very devoted to words. Um, it was um, quite a, a feat of economy, but it was only possible through the exquisite level of emotion and nonverbal um, transference of information and feeling that these actors were able to achieve in that scene. Okay, next one. Okay, I think we're going to darkest hour here. Prime Minister, the question of peace talks. Oh, we must tell Daniela. Signal only that we intend to fight it out until the end. Uh, peace offer uh, it really grounds our weakness. I agree. And even if we were beaten, we should be no worse off than we should be if we were now to abandon the struggle. Let us therefore avoid being dragged down the slippery slope with talk of a negotiated peace. Slippery slope. The only I suspect Italy and Germany the only slippery wish to get slope. us so deeply involved in negotiations that we should be unable to turn back. Nonsense. Bastianini informed me. I propose... The only slippery would slope... Would you stop interrupting me while I am interrupting you? When I chose my war cabinet, I took great care to surround myself with old rivals. I may have overdone it. Right on, Halifax. The approach you propose is it's, it's, it's not only, it's futile, but it involves us in a deadly danger. The deadly danger here is this romantic fantasy of fighting to the end. What is the end, if not the destruction of all things? There's nothing heroic in going down fighting if it can be avoided. Nothing even remotely patriotic in death or glory if the odds are firmly on the former. Nothing inglorious in trying to shorten a war that we are clearly losing. Losing! Europe is still... Europe is lost. And before our forces are wiped out completely, now is the time to negotiate in order to obtain the best conditions possible. 
Hitler will not insist on outrageous terms. He will know his own weaknesses. He will be reasonable. When will the lesson be learned? When will the lesson be learned? How many more dictators must be wooed, appeased, good God, given him mixed privileges, before we learn? You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth! Not bad. Um, yeah, that, by the way, that was Gary Oldman playing Winston Churchill. Completely unrecognizable. Um, the reason for showing that scene, one of the greatest uh, and oldest principles of drama is dialectic. The idea of two people arguing, both with fixed and opposite but equal uh, positions. Um, what is fantastically fun to play with as a writer is to give your anti-hero the better argument. Um, in this case, the moral center of the movie changes in that scene from Churchill to Halifax, who up till now has seemed a loathsome appeaser. But in the scene, he makes the, the most practical and life-loving and humanistic argument um, that peace, we should never give up on peace, that we should not stop exploring it. Um, and what happens is a wonderful thing for the audience is that their allegiance has to shift. It's their, their opinions are challenged. And, and uh, the most amazing thing can happen, that, you're, that you, 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 you go from an entrenched position and you move, you adjust. And, and in that, if, if we're capable of, as an audience of shifting our position, then you know, there's hope for the world. because. Most of the troubles in this world seem to me to come from people in fixed positions who can't conceive of any other idea other than their own. Um, OK, next clip. Thank you. Does anyone have a match? Thank you. Thank you. What are you all staring at? Have you never seen a, a prime minister ride the underground before? <laughs> What is your name? Oliver Wilson, sir. Mm. And what do you do, Mr. Wilson? Bricklayer, sir. Ah, bricklayer. We shall have great need of bricklayers soon. Our business will be looking up. <laughs> <laughs> ah, progress. <laughs> mm. How old? Five months, sir. It looks like you. Madam, all babies look like me. <laughs> well, uh, what is your name? And this is Jessie Sutton. Ah, this is Sutton. It's a pleasure. Abigail. Abigail Walker. Marcus Peters. Marcus Peters. <laughs> Agnes Dillon. Agnes? Morris Baker. Mr. Baker. Alice Simpson. Alice Simpson. Miss Margaret Jerome. Oh, a Jerome. Oh, well, my mother was a Jerome. I, I expect we're closely related. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, uh, sit, sit, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Baker. So, how are you all? Uh, how are you all bearing up? Uh, good, good spirits. Yes. Uh, just as well. We shall need them. Uh, uh, let me ask you something. 
that's been weighing on my mind. Perhaps you can provide me with an answer. You, uh, the British people, what is your mood? Uh, is it, uh, was it confidence? Yeah, yeah, confident? Confident? How confident? Very. Some people say it's a lost cause. Our lost causes are the only ones worth fighting for. Too right. Yes, now let me ask you this. If the worst came to pass and and the enemy were to appear on those those streets above, what would you do? Fight. Fight the fascists. Fight them with anything we can lay our hands on. Broom handles if we must, street by street. They'll never take Piccadilly. <laughs> I never said Piccadilly indeed. <laughs> and what if I put it to you all that we might, if we, uh, if we ask nicely, get very favourable terms from Mr Hitler if we enter into a peace deal with him right now? What would you say to that? Never! 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 Never. Never. Well, you will never give up. No, never. Then out speak, brave Horatius, captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth, death cometh soon or late. And how can man die better? than facing fearful odds. For the, For the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods. <laughs> Are you crying? I am. <laughs> yes, yeah. I am. I blab a lot, you know. We all, we all have to get used to it. <laughs> uh, what, what stop is this? It's Westminster, sir. Westminster, it's my stop. Included that scene because it's it's the one that's already the most discussed scene in the entire film, and it, it, it's discussed because people invariably ask, "Did did that scene happen? Do you have evidence that Winston ever rode the underground?" And the simple answer is, um, "There's no evidence that he that this scene ever took place." Um, so it, it goes on to a much bigger, bigger question, probably bigger than we have time to to deal with here, as to the limits of p artistic license and the point where that tips into artistic licentiousness. Um, it has to do with many issues to do with the tolerances of history and the tolerances of audiences and the contract that you enter into with an audience when you have the words before the title based on a true story. But um, essentially, if you're in the service of the truth and you responsibly are bringing in elements into a story, that you believe are consistent with that character and consistent with that historical moment, then, uh, then I think you're completely at, at, within your rights to import a scene like that. This, to defend a scene like that is very easy for me. Um, uh, did he ride the underground? Do we know that he did? No, we have no evidence. But at this decisive moment in British history, when Winston was wobbling and he wasn't sure whether to do a peace deal with Hitler, the the opinion of the public that, was, that, he, that he was receiving via polls um, was proved the turning point for him. So the dramatist says, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to have a scene with some polls, some two pieces of paper being put in front of him on his desk, and it says, oh, the people support fighting on, or do I have him go and meet the people? Now, it's consistent with his character that he often went off grid and popped up among the public to take the pulse of the public. Um, so I've combined those two things and created a scene. Um, 
it's amazing how many people uh, find it the best scene in the film and how, how many think it's uh, absurd or a, a breach of the, of the writer's contract. Um, it, I'm, I'm not quite sure why it's, it's controversial at all because I think it's what, it's what we do. I think it's our task and we're compelled to use our imagination and bring our imagination to the telling of true stories even where the facts you know, are, are known. Um, so that kind of... Uh, almost concludes our evening. Um, uh, I want to wish you good luck uh, for those who, like me, are workers in the vineyard of the word. Um, uh, you need a lot of it. Um, persistence is everything. Dare to fail. And uh, may you all earn your living doing what you love. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. There's, there's so much, I think, to, to get into now. Um, we're going to have a, a conversation between ourselves. Now. I think I ran a little long there. No, 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 you're perfect. You're, you're to the minute. It was perfect. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation and we can open it to questions from the floor after that. I want to pick up um, specifically on, on what you said about reverse engineering your story. Mm -hmm. Find the ending. Mm -hmm. work out a way to get to that ending that the audience is going to be desperate to land on it mm -hmm. but not expect to get there. Now, your, your two most recent films, Darkest Hour and The Theory of Everything, are both based on true stories, mm -hmm. incredibly well-known men whose achievements, I think Churchill in particular, mm -hmm. are not just widely known but quite well understood by the general public. So how, when you're adapting a true story, can you still take the audience to a point in history that they're already aware exists and still make it feel unexpected? Well, if you take Darkest Hour as an example, I, I began Darkest Hour um, at about 10 years ago, and it was at a moment when I realized that three of the greatest speeches of all time were written and delivered by Winston Spencer Churchill and, and within one four-week period. Now, it's extraordinary for, for any leader to create a speech that will, you know, rival a, a soliloquy from Shakespeare, but he wrote three absolute doozies in a four-week period. Um, and then I did a, did a little digging and did research and thought what compelled this, comp this outpouring of magnificent rhetoric, um, because it wasn't, it wasn't true of Churchill's whole career that he was churning out these great speeches. Um, and, and the facts were this, it, it was nothing less than the collapse of Central and Western Europe under the Nazi boot, and enormous domestic pressure at home to do a peace deal with Adolf Hitler. Um, I didn't know about the, the peace deal with Adolf Hitler. I'm, it, it's kind of airbrushed out of history, and, and I think the person most wielding the airbrush is Winston himself. He, uh, I think he devoted like a paragraph to it in his huge history of the Second World War. Um, so it was like, oh, there's news here. There's a different man than, than the one we're handed down from history. So, um, you know, that fitted in with all my little obsessions that pedestals are for statues and it's great to take heroes down and, you know, make them human. But you have to have, a, have justification for that. And I just found him wonderfully complicated and, and um, flawed and uncertain. And, and I thought, okay, now this is, a, this is a movie worth making. Because uncertainty to me, rather than being a, a negative, is actually a prerequisite in a leader because uncertainty allows for the possibility you may be wrong. And if we have leaders incapable of thinking that they may be wrong, we're all in deep shit, seems to me. There's a wonderful line that Cromwell wrote to the Church of Scotland. Um, uh, and uh, it, it goes like this. He said, I beseech thee in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be wrong. And I would love that to be written above the doorways of every world leader. Just allow for that possibility and then you'll be open-minded. So that's, that's the kind of, that's where I start to know my ending. I know that I'm going to create a man who you, you establish them as, as one thing and then you make them 
something else. You present them as something else. I saw the whole journey then. Given that you built the film around these three speeches, or that was mm. certainly the jumping off point for the screenplay, um, and the speeches are reasonably well known as, as, as political speeches go, they're very well known. Um, mm. Do you feel there's an obligation to, you know, give the audience Churchill plays the hits? I mean, was there a way in which you could bring a fresh take to these speeches um, when, when you sat down? Or did you think, OK, we're just going to let these play out? And there's, there's one moment I want to refer mm. back to specifically, but I'd, I'd just like to ask well, you in general first. There was no, in, in the House of Parliament, in the Commons, there was no recordings made of those speeches. So in fact, the, re the recordings we have of Fight Them on the Beaches and so forth, was made um, after the war, I think 1946, and the BBC said we should get a recording of these because they were rather good. And so the, it, Winston says, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it for my bed. And there's a photograph of him sitting in a little fat pink in his onesie, you know, and, he's, and they've got a microphone dangling from the ceiling. And he did a very quiet rendering of these speeches. So the, the, the copies we have are not I don't, and Gary, this is Gary's observation too, that they're, they're a poor um, representation of what he would have delivered to 800 parliamentarians because he, he was a showboater, he was an actor. So he really was on a stage. So when Joe Wright filmed the scene, and it's extraordinarily beautifully done when you see the film, we, um, Joe didn't put 50 p people in as extras, he brought in 800 extras fully costumed. Gary came out there like Winston would have done, like an actor having to belt those lines to the back rows. Um, so that's a completely different um, take on those great speeches that audiences will never have seen. But, but we think it's probably the most um, accurate rendering of them. Can I ask for a quick show of hands? Has anyone here seen Darkest Hour yet? I know it's, okay, so actually quite a few of you. Good, okay, yeah. okay. Um, Churchill's, maiden speech in Parliament as Prime Minister. Mm. Um, there's something incredibly uh, unexpected in the way that you present that, where you have him delivering the speech, so first of all, that's of interest, but then you set up this kind of parallel thing running where you have Chamberlain uh, decides that he's going to signal to his supporters, basically, in the House, whether or not Churchill is to be accepted and his, his presence as PM is going to be condoned. And this is going to be done by a gesture with a white handkerchief, which Chamberlain has sitting on his lap. So as an audience, simultaneously while you're listening to Churchill's speech, you're also, this kind of parallel story is ticking over in your head. And it's, it's set up, of course, by the, the two MPs saying this is what he's going to do and we should look out for it at the very start. Now, tell me about taking something that's like historically pre-existing and just giving it that extra, I don't know if the technical term is like a, a, a zhuzh or something, but you know, that, <laughs> that extra little tickle that is going to make it play more, yeah. even more cinematically than yeah. it might have perfect done. Perfect example, so perfect history. example of, of, re, of reverse engineering. So you, you, you know you're going to end up with this climactic scene and you know that the drama is going to depend on will he, by this speech, win every heart in the house. Um, so you, I know that the Labour Party will be sort of rooting for him. Will the Conservatives support him? Will the leader do, you know, give the signal? So I thought, okay, I need some signal. How would a leader communicate to the rest of his party who are waiting on a, on a gesture? So I, I just sort of chanced on the idea of a handkerchief. So I thought, okay, so at the end of the movie, I need him to pull out a handkerchief. Oh, I better establish that at the beginning of the movie in Act One then. Um, so that's what we do. So we set, we set it up in Act One, and, the, and now we all learn the, the sort of uh, vocabulary of this handkerchief that's going to signify this. And then at the end of the movie, as you say, it's not just about what's, what people are saying. It's a, you're then all waiting. So you get this terrific um, emotional um, sort of payload that comes with just the gesture of, of one man lifting a handkerchief. It becomes quite triumphant. But it's not the gesture itself, it's all the work you did earlier. The fact that the white handkerchief doesn't look unlike a flag of surrender, that mm. helps too, right? You mm. can kind of alight on the perfect symbol for the, for the mm. moment. Um, when when you've, you're telling a story here about Churchill and there's the fate of Europe's at stake, there's his reputation as a politician at stake, so there's different kind of things, different stakes on different levels. And with the theory of everything, that's, you know, you've got a story about a marriage in crisis, uh, you've got a story about a man's body, the, the kind of medical story of, of, of his, uh, his 
physical breakdown. Mm. And then also the story of his cosmological discoveries, his, 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 uh, the, the theory of everything itself. And those are three types of story that are quite, I would think, someone who's never tried to write a screenplay, but they, they, they seem, they would be quite difficult to reconcile in one story. They were. Right, okay, yeah. so but when you, were, <laughs> when you were going through this, did, yeah. did anyone uh, working title or elsewhere kind of say, do we need to have these three things happening simultaneously? Or on the other hand, did they like the idea that there's, there's a love story, but there's also a science bit, but there's also a medical bit? Mm. Um, they are, they're all moving parts and, and, they, and in the process, there are different moments in the evolution of a screenplay where it becomes uh, apparent that you need to do more with this one. You need to put the fader up on that one, the fader down on that one. Um, and that's what's terrific and, and collegial about, about the, the filmmaking process is there's so many people helping you at a certain point to make this better and you know, presenting arguments for even right down to the actors with Kristen Scott Thomas saying, I'll do it, but I want one more scene. She didn't actually say that, but it became apparent that she, <laughs> that she thought her, her role was, was kind of one scene too few. And, and, and she had damn good reason for thinking that. Um, and so it was, it, was, um, it fell upon me to, to, um, to write another little scene for her, but it wasn't just something for her vanity or anything. It was, we, we can go further with that character. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of little movements and stuff that you make. And, and when you work with the director and you, do, you work on a director's pass, they're trying to make, you know, find a way to tell the story cinematically. So you, then it changes again and you make the adjustments here. But it's all pretty much, you've made the suit, now you have to make the suit fit the client. So you're taking it under the arms and you're shortening this and shortening that. And it's a bit of tailoring and so forth. It's, it's all a fascinating process. By that stage, you were specifically writing for Kristen Scott Thomas as well, right? So that must, yeah, must change your approach to the, the character. Yeah, yeah. and you, then the wonderful thing is that they are kind of already inhabiting Clementine Churchill and Gary's coming out, and Gary will say something, a very actor's kind of note, which is, I'd like to shout in this scene, you know, and, and I'd be on set and we're, you know, two hours from shooting the scene, and I'd say, say to Gary, what do you think we, he should shout about? He said, I have no idea. But um, I had a very quiet scene before this, and I think it would be very effective if I shouted. Um, and for those who have seen the movie, when he does his first radio broadcast, um, I decided to have him changing the speech up to the last second. And he shouts at the, the BBC guy who's counting in and saying, sir, we're going live to the nation, three, four, two, one. And he's shouting. One moment, damn you! And that's Gary wanted a shouting moment, and, and it's it's very effective. So it's 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 all very very collaborative um, in a, in the best possible way. I don't think it's, it's any coincidence that both uh, the theory of everything and, and also Darkest Hour. If you've read any of the early reviews of it, something that has been absolutely fixated on is the transformative quality mm. of the central performance. So and, and you know what I, I love about it is that it's it's Gary Oldman doing Churchill, but it's still recognizably Gary Oldman. Mm. And it's a, it's a proper Gary Oldman performance in the, you know, going back to Sid Vicious and, and, and what have you. Mm. Um, and then similarly- nice arc, isn't it? Sid right, Vicious exactly, exactly. Um, and then with um, Theory of Everything as well, um, you know, that was an incredibly, like, you know, bone deep inhabited performance from mm. Eddie Redmayne. Mm. Now, when you're writing a lead role, is it possible to, calibrate what you're writing to, to, to sort of build in that transformative potential into it? Or is that something that the actor just brings? I mean, I don't know, maybe that's something you've, you've sort of fine-tuned since your earlier screenplays, or, or if it's something you, you've now, you feel that you've cracked. I think it was, um, uh, who was it? Noel Coward who said, the job of the writer is to write the lines that an actor will kill to say. Um, so, I, you have to create the arc. You have to create the roadmap for this actor. You have to have, play with all the colors. And, and then the actor will say, oh my God, I can, look what I can do. I can do triple somersaults here. I can do this. I have all the, the room to move to bring everything to the table. Um, it's very much in the writing. And then it, that, that's a launch pad for the actor. So um, yeah, it, 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 my, my attraction to both um, stories was the potential to write great roles. 
especially for everybody across the board, you want to do justice to them all. But, it's, but I sensed real potential in, in telling Stephen Hawking's story. I think he's, you know, um, they'll, there's, he's so unique, um, one of them in the universe. You know, to, to, to have one of the brightest people on the planet who has to speak through a computer is, is so far-fetched. It's James Bond, it's, it's you know, it's like the crazy idea of someone's, um, you know, sci-fi fantasy. Um, and with Winston Churchill, you know, a fantastically huge character with, with all, you know, the facility with language, his love of the word, um, and the, the movie really is a, a study in the power of the word. Um, it, and he's the personification of that, of the proposition that words can be enlisted to change the world. He's mobilized the English language, right? That's the last... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah right. the last line, which is Edward L. Morrow's line, which he, he wrote in eulogy for Winston. He mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. And that was the attraction with that, is, is to get an actor who can create that symphonic music with language. And, um, and the challenge to write for Winston Churchill, to write jokes worthy of Winston Churchill um, to put it, show him as a romantic man and what would Winston Churchill say to Clementine in a private moment um, it's all, it was all very daunting but also extremely exciting I was going to ask, does it, th that necessity tamping down your own voice in order to convincingly express these, I mean even just purely in, in terms of how it sounds, Stephen Hawking's voice, you know you could play a clip of Stephen Hawking talking and everyone in this room would immediately know who he was um, Winston Churchill, of course, he has that kind of, there, there's his public voice that he uses to deliver his speeches in the film. Uh, there's also his private voices, which, which sort of modulate in between those. Mm -hmm. But in order to convincingly uh, write dialogue in those voices, mm -hmm. are you conscious of removing yourself, like you will have a kind of a, um, a, a way of writing yourself that you then have to extract yourself from it? A little bit. It's, it is ventriloquism, emotional ventriloquism. Um, you, and it starts with researching their natural voice, which is available to us through the writings and through clips. Um, uh, we didn't, I didn't have any recordings of Stephen's voice pre the computer. Um, his voice was very slurred, the first news clippings of him. Um, he was already, his voice had already degenerated heavily, so I had no idea what he sounded like, but I knew how he wrote, um, and he's an extraordinarily good writer. Um, and a lyrical man. Um, so there was there was these clues, and yes, you, you try and um, you try and do justice to them. When when we finally showed Theory of Everything to Stephen, we had a private screening for him, and carried him in, literally carried him in in his wheelchair. It was like like a Roman emperor or something on his barge, and we sat him down and he watched the movie and I'm very very nervous. You can imagine, you know, you've you've done you know, a portrait of someone else's life and they're sitting right beside you. And the, 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 the lights went up at the end and he had a tear coming down his cheek at the end. And he, um, and he started writing his verdict on the film. On the film. Takes him ages, took 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> really, white knuckle, 15 minutes. As to what, and he, he, ha he wrote two words, broadly true. <laughs> 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 it's a good review, you know. It's a good review, and 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 there's a there's a strange thing, and that's another subject is that, is that, even though you've invented a great deal, I mean, I invented ninety percent of what he said, and 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 half the things that he does in the movie, we have no record of him doing, but he could own it, and the way that then, that history almost follows fiction, or and and embraces it, and and embodies it. There's a great story of, uh, of. Um, Picasso, he did a portrait of Gertrude Stein, and um, when he finally revealed it to Gertrude, she was horrified because it wasn't very, very flattering. And, and she said, it doesn't look a thing like me. And to which, to which Picasso replied, oh, but it will. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open this to questions from the floor. If you have a, a question, please put your hand up. Do we have mics? We do have mics. Do we? Yes, great, okay. Uh, just there with the scarf, yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed what you had to say. Uh, I've got a question about, you mentioned collaboration and mm. what do you think about script editors. I heard of quite a famous 
British screenwriter say recently that he hated them and only trusted two in, their, in his life. Um, so what do you think about that process of someone who can help, or are, are, do you hate shooting your babies? Well, my answer would be this. I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be wrong. <laughs> and that, that would apply to the script editor, and it would apply to me too. Um, you can always be wrong. You, know, you can always learn. Um, so I, I think you're unwise to throw out advice. They're only trying to help you in the, in the end. You, what your task is is, to, is to, to take the great ideas and say thank you and own them. Um, which is the lovely thing is that sometimes people give you you know million dollar ideas and 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 they walk happily into the distance and you get to sign sign your name on it um, but yeah and and when it's a it's a terrible idea it's a lousy one um, then that's your job too to identify it and, and come up with a very good reason but it often doesn't hurt you to try it out anyway um, and sometimes in trying out a lousy idea you come up with a with a third thing um, and, and that might prove a way forward. So it's, it pays to be flexible. Yeah, just now. Hi, Anthony. Um, <coughs> um, it's a pleasure to uh, tell you. My question is vague and nosy. Uh, you said that uh, it's OK Va to- Vague and nosy. <laughs> <laughs> you said that it's OK to mine one's life for a story. Um, and I've had a lot of life experience. Um, but I'm often shy to use it. Um, whereas my sort of belief in my writing ability is tenuous, mm. I do believe in my life experience. Mm. So I suppose my question, like the nosy part of me wants to ask what life experience you've had that you've used, but I guess better, how do you use your life experience? Like how do you use it respectfully? Or uh, like, like can it be like problematic? Well, I, I haven't done anything particularly autobiographical. But I write about the things I care about. I don't necessarily need to know the subject matter um, well, because that's, that's part of the joy of, of exploring the, the, and research and, and getting to know the subject matter as you learn stuff. But, but take Churchill, for example. Um, as soon as I sort of embarked on it, I thought I, I didn't initially know why I was fascinated by it. And this is where sort of the process of discovery starts because it becomes a self-journey into saying, oh, I know what I have in common with that guy, or at least the story I want to tell about this man is deeply personal to me. Why is it deeply personal? Well, it's got to do with that proposition I spoke of before, the, 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 the idea that words matter, that, that we have to sort of protect them, that they, they can change the world, you know. Um, and that is every writer's... Uh, every writer has devoted themselves to that proposition. Um, and, uh, and so that theme, I realized, is actually an autobiographical one. I, would, I did not know that, however, at the beginning. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, just at the front. Um, that was an amazing lecture. Thanks very much, Anthony. Thank you. Um, What's the best piece of advice you'd give to someone going from writing plays to writing films? Mm -hmm. um, this is a transition that you've made, we should say. Yeah. Um, they're very similar, um, very similar art forms. You, you, you're, you're in both, you're getting people in a room, you're making them do things, and you get, you're going out. The writer is always the, sort of the first director. Um, so th the skill set's very similar, but the vocabularies are different. Um, and it took a while for me to, to, to stop um, writing f f uh, cinema the way that I would do plays. I thought it was sufficient then to just have people walk in a room as if it was a stage um, and leave it up to the director to just make it cinematic. And then at the end of the scene, people would either stay or they'd, they'd leave. And the scenes would over where they're welcome as well. They'd be sort of long, eight, ten page scenes and so forth. Um, so they were essentially theatrical in nature. Um, that can work. There is, there's a scene in here, what, we just saw part of it here. It's eight pages long, um, which is unheard of almost in, in screenwriting. Um, so I, I love kind of flirting with the, the theatrical and, and um, 
you know, importing that thing that I love, which is just staying in a scene and making it, it long. But, um, but yeah, you have to learn the, the vocabulary of, of cinema. Um, I'm not sure any of these clips have shown you um, the way that, that I, I'm increasingly interested in the cut, um, which is ostensibly a director's interest and an editor's interest, but it's what you learn through the cut. Um, that is not a theatrical device, and it's something I'm, yeah, I'm still an apprenticeship in. Actually, in the opening pages of the Theory of Everything screenplay, you've got that cut, incredibly telling, back from uh, Stephen Hawking in, in the present, yeah. right back to him on the bicycle, where yeah. you see the kind of stillness and age through to, you know, full speed ahead, youth. Um, now, the way you wrote that on the page is mm. incredibly cinematic, because you have, bam, this happens, bam, Jane does this. Uh, bam, he looks and sees these two different things happening. There's footmen at the palace kind of rearranging things. Mm. And it's all intensely visual. Um, in order to start writing like that, was that something that you could kind of, in a, in a, in a related way, reverse engineer from watching films that you enjoyed, yeah. seeing how they worked and then? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also, take, you know, exploring those devices yourself, taking it to a certain point with one film, starting a new film and say, oh, that's, that's work to be continued. And then you get, get an opportunity in the next one to push a little further, push a little further and evolve and it gets more exciting. There's a sequence in, in Darkest Hour where Churchill's delivering his speech to, to Parliament, very long speech. Um, and so it cuts, it becomes non-linear and it cuts between the composition of the, of the scene and he's dictating it to his secretary while he's in the bath. And it's continuous, so it starts in the parliament, then the next line is him in the bath dictating it. And then the next line is the secretary typing it. And then you see the letters pounding out on the typewriter and so forth. And it was like, oh, this is a fantastic um, sandbox I'm in now. I can play with all these things. And the reason for getting there was that I'd just finished a movie where I'd been, it's uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, it's the Freddie Mercury story, where I had been playing with this idea that Every time Freddie is going to compose a song, you can cut to him recording it, you can cut to him performing it in a stadium, then you can cut back to him still um, composing it and, and play with all these time frames and so forth. And I'd had such fun playing with all these sort of devices of intercutting that I was able on this one to, to use that. So that's one of the little um, areas I'm exploring. Possibly a really great reason for having multiple screenplays on the go at once as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, take another question. Yeah, just down the front there. And then, sorry, not quite the front there. I'm, I was wondering uh, when you first started out, what kinds of things did you do to deal with or cope with um, not having a boss and having perhaps not as much time as you wish you could have um, for all the ideas that you have, or even you know, when you do find the time, that suddenly when you're you know, two hours staring at a blank screen, but you have the greatest idea when you're in the middle of something else and you can't <laughs> write it down. I mean, how, what kinds of things would you do to deal with all of that? Uh, I, well, my sort of evolution was I, I, um, I left university and I became unemployed. And in New Zealand, the welfare state is the great patron of the arts. You, they, they look after you handsomely for about as many years as you would like, and you can work on dealing with the tyranny of the blank page and what it is to have a whole day where you're supposed to write something and you have no idea what you want to write and all that sort of thing. And I remember being absolutely... Um, I was doing an original creative writing course at university, and I remember going to the, to the professor and knocking on his door and saying, it's awful. This writer's life is awful. You know, it, it's just hours after hours after hours. Everyone else has gone out into the real world to do real things. And I'm just home, you know, and there's n nothing going on and you know, nothing's in inciting ideas. And I'm, I'm trying to convince myself I'm a professional. And he said, yeah, it's tough, isn't it? It's a, it's a tough, tough job. And then he told me the story that you should create um, other claims on your time so that it's not all you're doing. And then you've got, then when you're doing this other thing, you'll be thinking, oh, I can't wait to get to my typewriter. And, and then when you do get that moment of your typewriter, it'll be a joyous thing, because it'll be, oh my God, this is a precious time that I have. Um, 
I, so I started doing that. I took a, a sort of job and I became a part-time writer for a while. But then I found that, that actually I wanted to be more selfish with the writing and I got more confident and comfortable with being alone for all these hours. I, you know, I grew up with seven children. Uh, I was one of seven children. Um, and uh, and uh, so I was used to noise and people being around and, and being a writer is so solitary. Um, it takes quite a lot, lot of time to get used to how to handle and make yourself productive with all those empty hours and stuff and so forth. It, now it's, it's, no, it's the norm, it's the default to, you know, everybody clears out of the house, brilliant. Um, I know exactly what I'm going to do and I know how I'm going to fill it and I can sit down and do eight hours and not bed, bed an eyelid. Um, but it's, it's part of the transition into, into thinking of yourself as a professional. Question a couple of from the front there. Um, Anthony, thank you for a brilliant lecture. Um, you mentioned um, the writer enslaving their characters, and you mentioned a um, beautiful phrase, uh, emotional ventrilo ventriloquism. Can you talk a little bit about how um, you managed to create characters in the public domain that have so much veracity and feel as if they belong in their time? Because writers... Um, struggle, all of us struggle with wanting the, the, the piece to be expiation. Um, and how do you control the material to the extent that you do? Because it's about period as well, isn't it? It's about making sure that you're writing about them in their time, mm. using the lights by which they steer. You, you were mentioning that to me earlier. Mm. How, yeah, how do you get it right? How, do, how does it feel authentic? How does it feel of its time yeah. and not anachronistic? Um, it's, it, it's research, it's, it's um, dreaming yourself into that world. Um, often when I turn projects down, it's a phrase I lean on a lot. I'm sorry, I don't think I can dream myself into this world. Um, um, but when you do, when you're exci creatively excited by it, um, usually you feel it's, it's in your, to use that American expression, it's in your wheelhouse. It's not in your time frame. It, it might be centuries ago, but, you, but the, the themes, um, the universal things, the timeless things, you feel you've got a grip on. Getting, getting hold of the language of the day is, is interesting. I'm just working on a Benedict Cumberbatch movie for his company about a 400-year-old man. So he's born in the time of Shakespeare, and I've, I'm spending my days trying to write Cod Shakespeare at the moment. It's awful. Um, <laughs> Because the, you know the bar is so high, um, um, it's never been higher. So it's a tough proposition. But I, I imagine that that um, and the research is still ongoing as to how you would how someone from a working class background living in the Gloucester area would have spoken 400 years ago. We don't have any particular records of that. So you're, you're sort of creating a reality that that you're hoping people will buy into. It's research, it's, it's sensitivity, it's using your instincts. Thank you. Yeah. In the door. Uh, yes, I just must say that The Darkest Hour is my favorite film this year. I think it's amazing. Um, one of the things that I think is so extraordinary about the way you've written it is how strong all the other parts are. Now, Gary Oldman's part, obviously, is amazing. Uh, Churchill's wonderful. But when you look at Stephen Delane playing Halifax or Ronnie Pickup playing Chamberlain, right. they're really rounded and strong. And I don't imagine that Gary Oldman's performance would be as strong if you hadn't written so many actually wonderful parts around them. Well, that's and I just wanted to ask you what you're going to write next. Well, we know you're writing for Benedict for 400 years, but what are the other four scripts that you're going <laughs> to do? <laughs> Well, we're, sh we're shooting one at the moment. Anthony Hopkins is playing Pope Benedict, and the wonderful Jonathan Price is playing Pope Francis. And it's a sort of, it's again a dialectic. Two, you couldn't find two more opposite types of people, both charged with the, with the spiritual um, leadership of 1.2 billion people. They're both meant to be infallible, but they can't agree on anything. Um, and I thought that was an interesting um, an opportunity for a sort of papal theological smackdown. Um, and um, we'll see how that one goes. That's, that's shooting right now. Um, again, it's, it's, it's themes that I go, oh, 
I think I know how to tackle that. that those, those themes interest me. I think I have something to say on those. Um, I'm doing a John Lennon, Yoko Ono love story, um, with producing it with Yoko Ono, um, which is an absolute privilege, oh, although she fell asleep on me when I went to see her the first time. <laughs> um, but uh, we have all of John's music and setting John's music within the context of the 60s and what the 60s meant and why, why the, the themes of the 60s meant so much to those people who lived through it um, is, is an incredible privilege. Doing the Benedict Cumberbatch uh, movie, um, working with a Alex Gibney, the great documentary filmmaker on a Vietnam War movie. Um, how many have I numbered now? That's four. That's four, yeah. Real people, so you're writing almost biographical films again. Do you like doing those rather than fictional films? Yeah, the, the Benedict Cumberbatch one isn't. Um, no. no, that's the 400 year old man. Um, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I've, I seem to have found myself in quite a happy situation to be in of, of sustained portraiture. Um, just walked around the Hockney exhibition of all those portraits, and I seem to be in a Hockney phase. Or, you know, but it, it didn't deserve Shakespeare to focus on portraiture. Um, so um, I'm, I'm very happily doing what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, uh, and, it, and just because they're historical and um, famous doesn't mean you can't make them um, contemporary and, and interesting and personal. So it's sometimes it's like poets say when you write a sonnet, the very, the very fact that there are severe limitations on, on what you can do can be actually very liberating. Um, and I'm kind of finding that. No, sadly, we've got to liberate you because yes. we've come to the end of our Q&A session. Anthony, thank, thank you, you so much. It's been yeah, fantastic. Thank you for being so lovely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.